What is happening, you beautiful bastards? Welcome back to another week. This week, we speak to one Ed Cronin. Ed is a career policeman. He was chief of several departments mm-hmm. and even went overseas to teach other countries how to police and learn from them. Mm-hmm. You might say policing has been his entire life. But he has a very different aspect on what policing should be than what I think the average person thinks. Yeah, yeah. He's got some uh, interesting insights. Um, you know, Grizz, you and I don't really know what the answer is, right, to the, the no policing does. situation in the U.S. Uh, you know, but we, I think we can all agree it's got some issues that we need to work out. It can always be better. <laughs> it can always be better. And uh, now our friend Ed is here to tell us, you know, what are his thoughts? What does he think we need to do to make it better? Uh, before we get into it, if you haven't noticed, we have switched up our schedule. We're going to uh, every other week for right now. Uh, between Jerry and I and our work, it's just getting way too hectic to do every week. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll return to it, but for right now, we're going to stick with the every other week. Yes, it was either that, our good listeners, or we retire. <laughs> but we love this show and you so much that we said we can't quit. We'll just give them less. What is happening, you beautiful bastards? I assume you were in the police force for some years? Yes, I uh, spent my life in uh, different aspects of law enforcement. I was a police chief for couple of cities in Massachusetts for a couple of years, uh, for a few years. And uh, I also worked a lot internationally. I retired from uh, the U.S. State Department. I was an oh, international police advisor working. I worked in different countries. So, so what, what does that look like? What, what are you advising, like the police in other countries? Yeah, well, um, it, it's kind of a long story how I got into doing it. But uh, the bottom line is uh, they sought me out. Okay. And the last gig I did was I did three years in uh, the country of Moldova, which is in the news right now because of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. And I left there right at the beginning of 2000. I worked there for three years. And one of the things I had to do or I was assigned to do when I got there is uh, help them... uh, migrate over to a Western style policing and kind of leave the Soviet style policing alone, even though they were independent and they've been out of that uh, Soviet Union for many years, there's still a very heavy, heavy Russian influence there. Mm. And I was brought in to uh, show different methods of how to do things. And the number one problem there, of course, was corruption. Mm. I was going to say, what does a Russian police force like ideal look like? Uh, I'm not up with the Russian police. Uh, <laughs> last time I worked with them was probably 25 years ago. Uh, I did work in everywhere from Siberia down to the Black Sea at yeah. one point. Um, but uh, as far as what it looked like over there, um, many of the former Soviet republics, you look at uh, um, Georgia, um, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, a lot of those countries have been fighting the, the being of being what they call a captured state. Mm-hmm. All right. And basically, that's a fancy word for saying that uh, monetary interests control the government. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, you have to, uh, you know, you have to go along with the system. You know, when I was in Moldova, they had X number of police chiefs and it cost 50,000 euros to get the position. And uh, once you get the position, <laughs> so instead of applying, they just bought it. Well, that's pretty much what a lot of them did. And then it's like a capo regime where mm-hmm. it goes down all the way to the streets where the guy stops you for speeding. And he says, you know, the fine's a hundred dollars, but if you give me 50 cash, we'll forget all about it. And <laughs> He gets his piece and then he's like, just like the mafia, he's got to pay tribute to his boss. And then his boss, his boss, his boss, it all goes back to the chief. So their so, whole whole police model was just a big shakedown. 
It was, but the good news was, uh, by the time I left, there were some very, very significant changes going on. And, That's good. And uh, yeah, and today uh, they actually have uh, a woman uh, who ran and is not corrupt and she's president and she's a graduate of Harvard University. And um, the woman there that's the Minister of Internal Affairs was a person that I promoted when I was working there. And she ended up being one of the key people in government. And pretty much now they have women running everything over there. And the good news is most of the women weren't corrupt. Say, that's a, that's got to feel pretty good. It does feel really good. And uh, that was one of the things I did there. I found the leverage points for changes. And the changes were in backing the women hmm. and That's empowering them. So. Women weren't corrupt. I mean, I know Russian police were very into, you know, strong arming and corruption and everything else in between. But yeah, that's interesting. That's fascinating. <laughs> Yeah. So you are you uh, trying to make similar changes here in the U.S.? Not necessarily well, to get rid of corruption, but uh, I know you're interested in changing the way policing happens here, right? Correct. Uh, like I said, I had a pretty uh, substantial career in law enforcement in the United States. Right. And one of the fabulous things I was able to do early on was when I was getting my master's degree, I had a chance to study for a short period of time in Oxford University in England. And I got a chance to work with the English police when I was there mm -hmm. and, uh, and also learn about some of their methods and things. And when I came back from that trip, I was like, man, they do things so much better than we do. You know? <laughs> they, don't, you know, they don't have murders every day of the week. They have very little gun violence. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and it's a lot of it's, you know, I, we come back to knowing it's cultural and all that stuff, but the point of the thing is, is that I've been working with different countries and different models, the Swedes, other people. And frankly, they do it a lot better than we do. Mm. All right. And we could be learning a lot, but unfortunately, there's an attitude, I think, sometimes that we know what's best. Um, but when you look at how many people the United States incarcerates every year. Yeah, you know, it's we're, we're way off the charts from any other country. You know, China is 1.6 yeah. billion people and they don't lock up a fraction of the people we do. And then the people we lock up are disproportionately a high yield of people of color. Mm. So something's wrong with the system. Now, does yeah. that does that tie into uh, the fact that we have essentially a for profit prison system? Because I don't know what the prison system looks like in other countries. Uh, I think that's part of it, but I don't think it's the root cause. I think it's a it's uh, kind of a byproduct. Yeah, it's a byproduct. And it's kind of, I think, a capitalist answer. Yeah. To, you know, dealing with human, you know, tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that, you know, what I would like to see different about policing is I'd like to see uh the style of policing that we use and the training we use change. Right. And I am a hundred percent a police officer and I back police officers. What I don't do is I don't back things that don't work. <laughs> right. And I'm not a, and I'm not a uh, person who wants to, uh, you know, hush things to keep things good for me or, you know, or don't be a rat or all that stuff. No, no, I, we have a lot of faults. And there's a lot of things we could do about it. Yeah, we actually, Andy and I talk about uh, the lack of training pretty frequently here on the show. Mm -hmm. And actually, a prime example, uh, Andy and I were just watching a video of the uh, response at the Uvalde school shooting. Did it's you get disaster. a chance to see any of those videos? That was a disaster. It was. To me, that, and it, to me, it's not, it's, it is a lack of training, but it's not, it, it, you have to revamp training, right? Yeah. And for the, the Uvalde thing, it's I almost can't even blame them. It was really embarrassing to watch mm -hmm. because I have military experience, Ed, and but yeah. these guys aren't trained like that, right? Well, but actually, it's almost to the point where they need to be. Well, technically, actually, you know, my dissection of the whole thing was the police chief blew it. He's the one that blew it. Because mm -hmm. I'll guarantee you out of those three or 400 cops that were there, Probably mm -hmm. everyone to a man was like, let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And that's what you're trained to do. 
because mm -hmm. you were in the military and the military are the people that change that train our SWAT teams yep. and our entry teams. And I have good friends that have been through that training who I talked to the day it happened. And, and one of them said to me, you go in. Yeah. It's exactly. not even a question. You go in. Mm -hmm. You can, so, if, even in the situations like, Hey, they were, they were halted for an hour and chained for the entirety of it. Yeah. And when they did start going in rooms, like it was very haphazard. There was no, like they didn't have that that devotion of like I'm going in this room and I have to go at a, at a million miles an hour and do what I need to do, um, but it, to me that just says they never really got training or they didn't take it seriously. Maybe you well, know it's all it's not going to happen in our town. It could be that you know yeah. um, I don't know if you know it, but the people that did enter were feds, and yeah, they got at, the word at a from, different time, right? Yeah, they got the word from Washington, go in, yeah, and they went in immediately. And it was over within seconds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, training is a big part of it. I don't know what they have in that part of the world, but I know that where I live in Massachusetts, we have some pretty, pretty finely tuned officers that are trained. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I used to be a detective. I used to hit the doors for drugs and stuff like that before we had those teams. And I'll tell you, I didn't like it because mm -hmm. you didn't know it was on the other side of the door. No, not at all. No, and then like you know yourself, if you're going in and there's an armed suspect, I mean, if you're in gear and you're, you know, you got the element of surprise, you're using the flashbangs, all that other mm -hmm. stuff, you got the advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't stand in the doorway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so many of them were standing in the door. I'm like, what are you doing? Right, right. Yeah, get out of there. Right. Oh, but it's just to me, I. It, it, it's bad in my mind that as a country, we have to have all of our police forces trained to clear rooms for that reason. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole separate issue. Right. But watching that video was just, it was embarrassing. It was like, they, they weren't ready for it. Right. Well, you know, I'm a little older than you guys. And I remember when I was a teen, I was in high school in the sixties and I had a good friend who used to go hunting. And uh, you know, every time hunting season would roll around, he'd bring out his shotgun and he'd get the machine and we'd hit the, you know, the pigeons. Oh, yep. Right. Play pigeons. And I didn't know guns from anything. And he'd give me a few shots with it. And, you know, and I'd always miss stuff. But he always <laughs> did good. And, you know, he usually went out for two weeks and deer hunting and came back with nothing. Uh, but it was an exercise and a sport. Yes. Absolutely. There was no political aspect mm -hmm. to guns in my day. You know, right. it was just something people did. It was a fun thing. They went, and now it's all become politicized, horrendously yeah. politicized to the point now, in my opinion, Uvalde and places like that are a direct result of this amplification of gun rights because it's brought the, to me, it's brought the proliferation of guns into such a high profile that people whether they're demented or not, they're using these things as a symbol mm -hmm. of power and using it to settle problems. Back in the 60s, nobody cared about that stuff. You know, the NRA was a, uh, was a gun safety organization. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, were, I, they were honorable in my mind in those days. Today, it's, a, it's become a political nuthouse. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I know people, not people aren't going to agree with me, but that's, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pro second amendment and i'm going to tell you that the nra to me is a joke <laughs> it's just a, it's money that's going into people's hands and it's not even yeah no it's a, none of it's good no no but so what do you what are your thoughts on police what are your thoughts that we have to start with for police reform i think there are a few things that we could do i think training is one of them and when I talk about training, I'm talking about uh, academy training. Let's stay there, okay? And, um, uh, you know, I, are you familiar with Bill Bratton? No, I'm not. He, he, he's, the, he's like the Pope of policing in the United States, okay? He was twice commissioner in New York City, once in Los Angeles and one in Boston, okay? Oh, damn. He, he's the Pope, all right? And he just wrote a book and I read it. And he came out with some similar ideas that I came out with. Uh, not to say that he's a heck of a lot brighter than me. He is uh, in his experience and stuff. But um, he had some, you know, he had some 
things to say that uh, are important. You know, one of the things he says in one of the chapters I read recently, he starts it out with, uh, is there systemic racism in this country? Mm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there systemic racism in policing? Yes, but, okay. And then he goes around and he qualifies it a little bit more. In my experience, when I worked as a police chief, I took over a city in Fitchburg, which was the murder capital of Massachusetts. We had a higher murder rate per capita than the city of Boston. And we had a dropout rate for the minority students at our high school at over 40%. And it came to me when I took over the job that after trying all these enforcement measures, which we did, we upped up all kinds of drug raids and nothing was changing. And it wasn't until I met a woman, this is, this, um, this is going to your question about what we should be doing. It wasn't until I met a Spanish woman, a Latino woman who came in and saw me when she was working to try to get the schools to perform better. And she asked me to be part of a task force because I was the police chief and all this other baloney. And so I, I took part in it. And I expressed my frustration to her about all the crime that was going on in the Latino community and the murders and the drugs. And, you know, I can't even find anybody to talk to in the community, you know? Mm. And I says, you know, and I was kind of putting her on the defensive. And then she turned around and she said something to me. She said, well, what are you doing with all your power? I said, what do you mean? She says, well, you've got the million dollars budgets. You've got the manpower, you've got the cars. Um, you get the guns. What are you doing about it? Mm. And it made me look at it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, we are doing a process that's not working. So yep. we, we better start looking at things a little bit differently. So what I did in this particular instance was I began to have more conversations with this woman. And then she brought me in she brought me into these groups of mothers, Latino mothers, who would tell me all about the discrimination that their kids were going through in school, uh, the racist police officers that worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what I chose to do was I didn't defend anything. I just listened. Mm -hmm. And I really listened. Okay. And one day I went up to the high school just to check it out, see what was going on up there. And I pull up in front, get out of the car, and there's an assistant principal screaming down the street at a Spanish kid telling him, Jose, you're 16 next week, and you're out of here. I'm kicking you out. Okay? That was the way they were dealing with things. Mm -hmm. These kids were coming into the crime scene, into the gangs. All right? Yeah. So we had a systemic problem that was going on. And it was much bigger than just the police department. Yeah, we had our bad apples. But we began a process where we began to work. And this is what I would like to propose, some of what I would propose. We took a process that's called systems thinking. And we put a task force together in our community representing minorities and all forms of leadership from education to lawyers, to criminal justice, uh, medical, you name it, okay? And we used a process called systems thinking. And that's a process that was came out of Massachusetts Institute for Technology and still used. And uh, we trained the task force to look at why was crime occurring in our city? And I can't talk explicitly about the methodology that we use, but we came out with two results. The first was the occurrence and the being of systemic racism in the city in general. Mm -hmm. The second was lack of economic opportunity for at-risk kids, mm. all right? And I remember when the Spanish guy got up and he gave the results to the group, three white leaders in the room stood up one after the other and said, we're not talking about racism. It's not going to happen. And I stood up as the police chief and I said, yeah, we are going to talk about racism, okay? And uh, some people left the the building, they didn't want to be involved in it. But we had many conferences after that to talk about the issues. One of the things we did immediately, I was confiscating tens and 20,000s of dollars in drug rates 
using it for enforcement. Instead, mm -hmm. I used it to create jobs for kids, along with other agencies in the city that kicked in. And after the end of that summer, the crime rate went down. All right. And the bottom line is this. We identified systemic racism back in 2005, and no one was talking about it. OK. Mm -hmm. Today, the city had one murder last year, and the dropout rate is below 8%. All right. That's a significant change. Mm -hmm. That's a huge change. All right. And it didn't happen overnight. No. Okay? So, what I'm thinking is we need to be looking in the long term to really fix things. Okay. Yep. And these short term solutions, you know, these shotgun solutions. That's not going to change work. things in the long run. Legislation is not going to change things in the long run. You've got to change the relationships with people. We need uh, a mentality change. Yeah. You know, even like I, I didn't really realize this, but I came up with this idea of, you know, when the police office is in academy for 20 weeks, mm -hmm. take them out for four weeks and put them in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Put them in an agency like the Spanish American Center or someplace and work with people mm -hmm. that are, you know, going hungry or have all kinds of problems that you don't even know about. You've never even come close to mm, right. and, do a, and do a project and something like that. And then I, I just read Bratton's book and he was doing that in New York city. Mm -hmm. I would almost say they need to do that while guys have been out for a few years. Cause you know, you get numb to seeing the same things over and over and over again. And it happened. It's not just police. All right. So I was going to say it's, it's an, it's interesting that you point out that, uh, one of the most important things you saw was a difference in how you approached the relationship between the population in that city and the police. And right. that, you know, for you guys, that made the biggest difference. Right. Um, because when I think about police, anybody that I know, it doesn't matter who they are. I'm just an average white guy. And this has been my experience too. Uh, unless you called the police because you needed something, if you see one, it doesn't make you feel safer on average. You just get paranoid. Right. And that's that's not really a healthy relationship for anybody. And I know for, uh, you know, especially black people, right. uh, when you see in the news what's going on with them. Right. Uh, I'd imagine the paranoia that they feel is significantly amplified. The tenfold. Yeah. Right. Well, you, you hit it right on the money. And another one of the changes that I would advocate in training for police is, you know, we've heard this term lately, critical race theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you can call it what you want, but the fact of the matter is, since the inception of this country, even before we were a country, law enforcement has been used to enforce things like slavery, mm -hmm. All right? We've been used even after the Civil War, they came in with the Black Codes in the South. Guess who, guess who enforced it? The police, you know, you come right. into the 20th century, all these issues are going on, the lynchings and everything. Guess who's behind a lot of it? The police. OK, so there's a, um, a long legacy of the police casting fear. OK, mm -hmm. and what I'm not a big fan of the people that walk around and say, oh, you're woke and, you know, big deal. And that happened 100 years ago. No, there was a thing on Facebook the other day. It showed a kid in 1923, 14 years old, being electrocuted in a photograph for killing a white woman that he never killed and the police mm -hmm. framed him for it. All right. Well, I would argue that there are relatives alive that probably still remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. So, and that stuff is passed down generation to generation. You know, my friend Andy there in the military, you've seen PTSD. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't just affect the, 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 the soldier that affects the family. It affects the kids. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. And if you don't deal with it, Guess where it goes? And Next it's not generation. To just military either. <laughs> no, no. And so, you know, there's a reality here that, you know, there should be education on that for police officers mm -hmm. to understand those issues. And, you know, and then we have a beautiful educational system where, you know, officers can go to school, you know, in Massachusetts, especially, most of the cops are all college trained. They have good criminal justice courses. It can be courses like that. Mm -hmm. It can make us better at what we do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for the mentality change. I think it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. I think the training needs to happen. Um, 
the problem is, I mean, how many places, how many cities, especially within the police force, are they just sitting there and saying, we're, we're too far gone, we're, we are unfixable. Right. You know, I mean, if I'm working in, in Baltimore, or I'm working in Detroit or I'm working in Chicago, I mean, I can understand why cops would be thinking that. And on top of that, they probably feel like they're just beaten down right now. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that it, it's not deserved in areas. Um, unfortunately, the media, you know, takes that and goes with it. But they should strive to be better. I absolutely agree with that. But I, at the same time, how do you get those towns or cities? Because usually it's more cities to you know we got to flip it we're headed in the wrong direction right and i'm not a big proponent of well i am in a way but i'm not a big proponent of fixing things i'm a better proponent of coming up with a better way okay and here's something that you might find interesting um policing has changed dramatically since Mm 9-11 okay before before 9-11, the 90s, <clears throat> 80s, there was a renaissance in policing in this country. There was something called community policing that was heavily advocated and supported by the federal government. Okay. And uh, it got to the point uh, before they start cutting the programs and they got rid of them where, you know, police departments that actually compete for grants to see how creative they could be to work with their communities, okay, and come up with solutions. I remember going to conferences, you know, police conferences, and 20% of the people at the conference were civilians. Hmm. They were going with police to work and train together and then build these great relationships, okay? Hmm. So after 9-11, that all went out the window, all right? There's no more money for that. It's Homeland Security. And then what happens then? We get into two wars, all right? Right. So... We spend trillions in that, all right? So what happens after that is we get a lot of people coming back from war to be police officers, mm. all right? And I'm, my father was a decorated veteran. He was a prisoner of war. He was a hero to me, the whole nine yards. Uh, and I support veterans 110%. But someone coming from combat is not always the best person to be a police no. officer in what we need today. No, because it's it's two totally, completely different things. No, but there are police officers who make, you know, who are veterans who are fabulous, but it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've kind of, we've gone off the track and we need to get back on it. And I think the government could do something about that Mm -hmm. by, you know, starting to reward the behaviors that you want to see and I want to see, you know, Mm -hmm. to get these people out of that, as you were saying, uh, and this downcast, you know, place where they are right now, you know, they're hurting. Absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the, the conversations that are happening at work that I hear now where, you know, we have a, we have an issue right now with mass shootings. Um, um, and, and I'm not thinking it's directly, I don't think policing is an issue there, but you're here. I hear a lot of people talking about, I'll just get a concealed carry. And I don't think more people having guns on them at all times is the answer. What's your thoughts on that? Um, well, I'm probably skewed on that. Um, mm. I remember um, a few years ago, uh, a relative of mine, um, uh, well, let's just put it right out. He was a Republican. <laughs> so he goes out and gets a gun. No interest in it. But he goes out and gets a gun because it becomes part of his identity. Mm -hmm. All right. And it's not, you know, and I see so much of that today, you know, that it's become, it's become, you know, it's, you know, here's a good, here's a good author for you, Carolyn Anderson. Mm -hmm. She just wrote a book about the second amendment Mm -hmm. and I haven't read it yet, but I listened to her uh, on a broadcast and she's done extensive research into how the second amendment came about. Mm-hmm. All right. And we had a constitution and then we had a constitutional convention and then the amendments were put forward and what's in there, free speech, you know, uh, different things, voting, whatever they were. And all of a sudden guns are in there. Why are guns in there? You know? Uh, and she goes into this deep process 
in research, and I haven't read the book yet, but she talked about it, that when the convention came together, slavery was still in vogue in many states, including Virginia. And Virginia insisted on the Second Amendment that states have the rights to raise militia, Mm -hmm. right? And if you think about it in a common sense, why would they want that? Maintain the status quo, probably. They didn't want to lose what they were about to be losing. Okay, but what would they be afraid of? Oh, other states or potentially uh, the uh, uprising of slaves. Bingo. So she argues in her book that the protection of slavery was the reason the Second Amendment came about in the Constitution. Mm. All right. Now, I'm not going to sit here and advocate that and say it's true and everything else. But somebody's doing the research and they're finding these things out. Mm-hmm. You know, you know how legislation is, you know, you don't want to watch it. It's like, you know, <laughs> watch it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. You know, so I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I just don't get these mass shootings. I, you know, fully automatic weapons for what? You know, I mean, <laughs> We talked with a woman about them, and it's all males, and it, the sign every time the signs are there, yep. but people are ignoring them, right? You know, and it's something has to be done about it. I think, all right, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do need to train our police to have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just another burden they have to carry. But right. there's something else, just like you're saying with this. The root cause isn't. I mean, the guns is part of the problem, right? It's the, right. the tool they're using. But right. there's a root, root problem there that we need to deal with, and we're not even looking at it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's polarized. Yeah. You're right. And, and I agree with you in that sense, you know, because I think the right to bear arms has been stolen, let's say, from mm-hmm. what it was intended to be. You know, in terms of, you know, yeah, there are reasons that people have to carry a firearm. I was a firearm in the state of Massachusetts. We had the strictest laws. I know. Good luck. (laughs) Okay. All right. But you know what? I was eight years of police chief. You know how many people I turned down in eight years? How many? Two. 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 And you wouldn't have given them a gun in a million years. Because they were nuts. Okay. (laughs) But the point of the matter is we did the work and we did the screening process. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, knock on wood, we haven't had one of those mass shootings here in Massachusetts yet. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, at, it, at the rate that they're increasing in frequency, though, it might even be inevitable in, in every state. I hope not. But I think you could probably. Right. I know. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Unfortunately, I, I hope it's not. But how could it not be? It's just getting insane. Yep. It is. I mean, it's every other day. You know, you know, but I mean, with what you were talking about to come back around again with racism within the police force, Mm -hmm. even if it's not there, I feel like it's going to get interjected, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying it is there or not there, but even if it's not like your people are going to, you take the, um, who is a guy in Ohio, right? Um, He happened like, Almost it was identical timing to. Uh, You're talking about Jalen Walker. Jalen Walker, and then it had the same timing as the uh, the kid did the mass shooting in, in, in Chicago. Or in Chicago? Chicago, Chicago, yeah, uh, Highland Park. Both situations, they're not completely scenario, but are completely uh, the same. But in the end, the black guy is killed, and the white guy is not harmed at all. Right now. Did racism play a part there? I have no clue. But the media is going to spin it that way. Yes. You know? Well, I think, I think, you know, I I back it up on that type of a question by saying that, and Burt Bratton says it in his his book too, systemic racism is evident everywhere in America. Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, the basic tenets of our policing is, supposed to be the police are a reflection of our society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. So, you know, uh, many people, I think, have their own points of view about certain things. 
I think it's only been in recent times where it's kind of become inflamed politically to talk about the issue. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, I think it's made it harder on the police because of that. Absolutely. You know, and I agree with you. I think here's a, here's an interesting scenario where I, again, another area where I differ with some of my colleagues after I had worked in my city for three years and we did our process and things started to get better. And, and then eventually after I left, they got much better and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But what, before I left, we had a shooting in my city. All right. It was a young 19 year old black man kid who I would call as a, you know, he was a minor criminal. I knew who he was. I was the chief and I knew who he was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, misdemeanor stuff, stupid stuff, you know, 19 years old, you know, he's driving without a license. Okay. And he gets chased by the state police and they come into my city. All right. So he turns off on a side street. One of my police officers gets, gets involved and he cuts the car off. So the car can't go forward. The guy, the kid pulls over the state trooper gets out of the car. The kid panics and hits the gas and goes towards my officer who's getting out of the car, who happens to be a black officer too. So the state trooper just acts on instinct, takes his gun out, shoots the kid and kills him right in the back of the head. So um, I get a call on that and uh, it's in the middle of the night. So I go to work in the morning, going in my office, the phone rings immediately at 8 a.m. And it's one of the black ministers, advocates that I worked with so many hours, tons of hours in the community with him and other people. And he says to me, instead of, you know, the usual, hi, hey, how you doing? He's like, what happened? And I know what he wants. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. Everything I know. And it's not going to be any of this. Uh, well, you know, I got to talk to the district attorney and I can't say this and I can't say that. I said, no, Tommy, this is what happened. And I told him the story, just like I told you. And I said, and I talked to Dougie, our officer who was black. And I said, what did you think? And he said, chief, he didn't shoot him. I would have. Mm. Right. So what happened after that happened? Two or three days passed. We had articles in the newspaper blowing it up. We had protests, <laughs> all the other stuff. And one of the leaders in the community came out and said, the police were the only people, the only agency that were doing anything to try to be transparent about mm -hmm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any problems in terms of crime after that. There were protests, mm -hmm. all that stuff, you know. But what's the difference when you go to a city like Ferguson and there's a shooting and everything blows up? And well, I don't you know, think that, you have those people speaking out now to say, hey, they're trying to be transparent. I think nowadays people just want to catch that wave and ride it. You know? But I also think something's missing. Mm. You got to have those contacts. You know, yes. Stephen Covey, you ever heard of him? No. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, Do yeah, I, I have heard that one, actually. Yeah. yeah well, well, one of his mantras is um, you have to have an emotional bank account with people. So if I've been working in the community and doing a lot of work, speaking up and advocating, being honest, I've got a relationship with them. Right. So when the chips are on the line, I had to go to the bank mm -hmm. and the money was there. So I'm thinking that in the last 20 years, we haven't been advocating community policing. Does Ferguson and all these other communities, do they have these strong relationships anymore? I doubt it. Do they have go-to people? You know? Well, yeah. No, they, they probably don't, because even even if you watch the uh, interaction in the news, there's no uh, there's no real community leader that's coming out and trying to have an actual dialogue with the police. And that's pretty indicative that they don't have a relationship to begin with. Right. And who has the power in that relationship? The police. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, what I've always done, it's incumbent on me to reach out. And when you said, what can we do about it? We need to change our leadership model. Mm -hmm. you know, I work in an organization, volunteer, <clears throat> Massachusetts Association for Professional Law Enforcement. And that's one of the things I'm working on now in a leadership group. You got to call it the way it is. 
right. you've got to step up and be honest with people. Now, uh, yeah, another uh, another issue that has come up in conversation here uh, a number of times is, uh, I don't know how much truth there is to this, uh, but from the perspective of me and Andy, it seems like uh, there are some issues with hiring practices in police forces. And I don't know if this is nationwide or just in the areas that we've seen, mm -hmm. but I don't really know what the criteria is that they're mm -hmm. looking for in a police officer, but it seems like they tend to pick people who are already bullies. Um, I think it can attract people. Yeah. Um, especially people that come from chaotic environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's a way of seeking order in their lives. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's just a general thing. That was actually told to me by a therapist one day. Uh, <laughs> and I think there's a lot to it. Um, yeah. I, one of my mantras that I'm interesting, interested about is, um, first of all, you know, in a lot of states, you can be a police officer when you're 19. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts, I think, is 21 now. Um, well, guess what? The human brain doesn't fully develop until you're 26 years of age. Say I was an idiot at 19. <laughs> yeah. Right? At 19. I, I had no business even I thinking about that sort of thing. Right. And the last part of the brain to mature is the frontal lobal part of your brain, which is reasoning. All right. So when you're bringing people in at a young age, you know, this isn't the military, you know, the military, you know, you got to take that hill, take that hill. You know what I mean? You haven't got time for an argument. Okay. Nope. I get all that. But these are police officers, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that here's a, here's another little side bite for you guys. Policing in America is only 200 years old. All right. And it came out of Britain. All right. Where somebody by the name of Sir Robert Peel decided that he was going to make a civilian police force. Why? You ever heard of the expression, read him the riot act? Mm -hmm. You know, where that comes from. No, nope. That comes from in the days 200 years ago when the public would go out in London and they get sick of the king and the taxes and they start rioting. OK. And before it would happen, the military would go out. The king's emissary would get up on his horse. And he'd take out a scroll and he'd open it up and say, the king commands you under the riot act that you will disperse immediately or else, okay? And then he put it back in. Of course, they wouldn't disperse, so they send in the military and they kick ass, right? right? However they want. So one of the first things he did was he said, we're taking policing out of the military's hands. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it differently. We're going to come up with a mantra of they have to be, the people have to be the police and the police have to be the people. And the police cannot function unless they have the authority of the people. Right. And one of the first things he did symbolically was he changed the uniforms of the British red to blue. And that's why we wear blue today. Okay. Then they had these uh, the troops had, the military had the brass buttons. They went to copper buttons, okay? And we gave them a whole new different look and a whole new different mantra. And that's where our policing developed, you know? <laughs> and it's, even if you go into, I go into Eastern Europe now, they're wearing blue, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, what I'm trying to say is this, it's only 200 years old. Mm -hmm. That's not long in history, okay? No. We need to be looking at, doing it differently in the future. Right. Absolutely. You know, so that's where I, you know, instead of getting hung up on passing a law and fixing this and fixing that, we got to be thinking ahead. You know, uh, you guys, you know, you were just bringing up a, a good point that jogged me. And it said, I was thinking like, you know, I had a hundred officers working for me at one time. Okay. Now, ideally today, I probably, my force would probably look like, 80 uniformed officers and 20 civilians today. Because I want to be looking at what kind of services we need to be giving to people today. Mm -hmm. All right. We don't need to have guys heavily armored going in and taking out mentally ill people. All right. Who, you know, mentally ill people are extremely erratic. They can get very violent, but it's not, they're not necessarily violent people. But if we're sending in people for combat, to deal with these people, something bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it does all the time. 
All right, so maybe there are other resources that we can be developing as part of our policing. You know, I'm always, I'm for the policing all the time, you know, but mm -hmm. I think we need to be getting out of the box a little bit. We need to be Absolutely. thinking about how we can do it better. One thing that, that we've talked about on the show multiple times is, you know, I, I support the police, but I also think not everyone who works for you is going to be perfect. You're, mm -hmm. not, you're going to have bad eggs, right? Yep. But I don't think that we have the, there's something that's got to change to get the right people into policing, right? Mm. I don't yep. know if it's money or, or, or what it is, right? And I'm not saying that money's the answer, but same thing with schooling. We're not pulling the right people into school, into policing. And we need to find out how to get those people into that job who would make that job theirs and do it to the degree that they, they need to do it and that the, the public deserves. Well, you know? I think that's a great start because then when you find out who you, what you want, you know, as a police officer, then you have to come up with the idea of what does the job look like? Mm -hmm. And it can't be what it looks like today. No. Okay. So there's a, you know, you're right on it, Andy. You know, yeah. we need to re be redesigning and rethinking about how we're going to do this. And remember where I said, you know, look at the results. You were incarcerating people a lot of, you know, like it's going out of style. You know what I mean? It's I mean, and, and failure, it doesn't work. It, as uh, we've talked about on the show as well, there's an issue there too, right? When there are certain prisons in this country, I think Arizona is one of them, uh, that when you get out, you're you're rehabilitated, right? You're 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 put out with a better case than when you went in, right? Mm -hmm. And we know through personal experience that in our area, which it kind of shocks me, you're pretty much just dropped on a fucking curb. Right. Yeah. It's just like, yep, actually, you uh, go. actually, Grizz, uh, my personal experience recently, uh, I have many siblings and one of them uh, recently was in jail. Uh, he was in jail for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, so he called me and said, hey, I'm going to get released on, I think it was, uh, what was uh, the, was it Memorial Day, Grizz, that I was telling you about? It was a holiday weekend, yeah. It was, and so they wanted to get him They on wanted Friday, to drop right? him off on a Monday, get, to release him on a Monday, which happened to be a holiday. So, so they said, hey. Uh, Monday's a holiday, so today's Friday. We're going to drop you off. And they literally dropped him off on the side of the street in the middle of the nearest major city right. and drove away. That right. was the extent of any help that he got and any, any we rehabilitation. Might as well just shoot ourselves in the foot right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. that was it. That was the, the whole situation. They just dropped him off and left. And that, you know, it, it comes back down to the prison system. And again, my, like me, my brother is white. So, if you were a black person who is already dealing with being at a higher rate of incarceration, it'd be even worse. Right. So what's the fix for that? If, you know, what, what's the real answer? How are we going to get out of this situation? You know? Well, I think one of the ways to start is we've got to get out of the punitive model. Mm -hmm. You know, in the United States, and it's not like this in other countries. No. In the other, in the United States, when someone commits a crime, um, everyone wants punishment mm -hmm. and humiliation or whatever it is you want to call it. And, you know, I'm not saying there are a lot of people out there that need to be in jail. That's not the issue. But the issue is, um, and again, it starts like in the school systems, okay? Uh, you ever heard of this concept of restorative practices? Mm. All right, this is a system where they use it in schools, but it actually was invented about 30, 40 years ago by the police in New Zealand. And they use it. And uh, some places in the US are using it now in the school systems, okay? But basically what it is, is this. Remember when I told you about the high dropout rate we had in that story I told you? Yeah. All right, well, what's going on, obviously, you know, once you stick your head and you see what's going on is these kids are at friction point with the teachers all the time and with other kids There's acting out. There's all kinds of behavior that, you know, contributes to this whole thing of this, uh, you know, this uh, rat race of how fast they're going to throw them out. OK, well, restorative practices stop things. OK, so let's say a black kid is in a school and let's say he. Uh, so out in the schoolyard and he whacks a white kid or something like that, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know. So rather than putting him in detention, 
or suspending him and putting him out there, they use what they call a restorative practice. And for lack of a better word or understanding, think of it as like a circle, Mm -hmm. all right? And you have to participate willingly, but they'll bring the victim in, they'll bring the teacher in, they'll bring the kid who did the assault in, they'll bring his friends, the victim's friends, and sometimes even the parents. And they begin a conversation. And this is even better than court because the victim gets a chance to really say how they felt, okay? And you listen to. And then this kid has got to listen to that. And when he's done, he gets a chance to speak. And then he also gets a chance to say, how can I make up for it? And many times in these cases, it works out where the the offender will come up with something that they're going to do for the victim in order to make him feel whole again, all right? And then the victim ends up being satisfied, they're being heard, the families feel better about the whole thing. And the change, big change is one thing. The kid that offended is brought back into the community. Instead of being ostracized for essentially forever. Or stigmatized. Yeah. Right? So... Does it work in every case? No, it has to be Mm. voluntary, but it can be extremely effective. You know, and the police use it in some countries. And I was in England, they were using it. You know, uh, they bring a kid in that was stolen, that was stealing cars. Mm -hmm. I was talking to an officer over there. And, you know, instead of bringing them to the court and spending all the money and wasting all the time, bring the kid in, they bring the guy who's had his car stolen. He meets the kid head on. They talk about it, you know. The guy tells him, no, you cost me two days pay at work and blah, blah, blah. You know, all this other stuff and the inconvenience. And the kid has to compensate the guy for his time lost. And he comes up with, you know, another type of strategy. And anyway, the case gets resolved. The kid doesn't offend again. And everybody's much happier than if they went to the court system. Mm -hmm. So that's a proponent that we, that's a, a, a strategy we could be teaching in policing today you know, working with neighbors that are fighting and stuff like that. You don't have to arrest everybody. There's other ways of handling these things. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. By handling it the way we historically do in the U.S., you end up with things like the three strike laws that are in parts of our country where petty crimes end up putting people away for the rest of their life. Right. That's a, that was, that's a very, uh, you know, that was part of the put 100,000 cops on the street strategy. Yeah. You know, and that was one of the bad outcomes of it. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they didn't get the outcome. I think that they were seeking. It seemed like a, a big backfire. Yeah. You know, at first they did, you mm-hmm. know, because they were incarcerating people and taking them out. Yeah. You know, uh, and a lot of times they would go after the bad actors and stuff like that, which is what they propose today. You know, you should be concentrating on who the real bad people are. Mm-hmm. All right. But you know, they went into this Brent broken windows thing where, you know, arrest for minor violations, but it, it got out of control. You're right. You know, and people are being arrested and, you know, we well, you know what they're in jail for marijuana and, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah. What, what did you think about San Francisco and their, their DA being very lax on pretty much any minor crime? Um, I, I don't know their situation per se, but I can say this. Um, I understand what he's trying or she's trying to do. It was right. But I think you have to have, you know, bright lines and boundaries in place with stuff like that. You know, you can't just say, you know, let them go. Mm -hmm. That's not the answer either. Yeah. I think it lasted uh, six months to a year. And then the, the, the community itself voted the DA out. Right, right. Um, yeah, it got to a point where, where people were leaving their car doors open, their tailgates open, so people wouldn't smash the windows to get into their cars because they knew they weren't going to get persecuted for stealing these things. And right. it's just, they went from one complete end of the spectrum to the other and neither worked. Yeah, well, I think that goes to a lot of what I would think I've been talking about mm-hmm. yeah. hour about building relationships. And, you know, laws or lack of enforcement are not the answer. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I I like a lot of the ideas that you have in a lot of the things that you're talking about. So let's say let's say that you were in charge of uh, the 
police force of everyone in America. What? Let's reiterate, what are a couple of the big things that you would change immediately to start heading in the right direction? I asked, I was asked this question earlier today by somebody else. Oh, no kidding. I, I love this question. Yeah. And uh, actually, I said, I would love to be the head of the Department of Justice. Okay. okay. So I'd be standing or sitting next to the president and advising him on what to do. Okay. And I would be saying to him, you know what? We could look at what's been done in the past and been successful. Let's put some money out there for some of these communities, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's give them the grant applications with the information in it that says, we want to see A, B, C, D policing with these results, all right? So send us a grant application, okay? And start a process like that where, first of all, I would take a lot of the philosophies that I advocate and put them in to these grants. And what happens and what will happen is that there's going to be a tremendous flourishment of ideas that are going to come out of that. I'm talking about little bits and pieces that have gone through my mind. There are 100,000 people out there that can come up with better ideas than mine, but mm -hmm. we got to incentivize it. Absolutely. So, so as a matter of policy, that would be the first thing that I would do. I That's like a good it. Start. Sounds good. That's a good start. Getting all the perspectives that you can actually uh, scrounge up and go through it, see what works, because clearly what's happening now doesn't work. Right. And I'm also, you know, unlike some people, I am an evidence based person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't accept anecdotal information as being facts. I don't care about ad hominem opinions and all that stuff. When I got crime going on, I want the stats down. Mm. that's the bottom line. Or like you just said, you know, if people are running rampant all over the place, it's the failure. All right. Mm. Or if we're locking up X amount of people, it's a failure. All right. So show me something that proves to me through the process that we're going to employ that we get real results that are sustainable. I like it. Well, yes. I think that's uh, an excellent positive note to end it on. All right. Well, you guys have been terrific and the questions have been right on the money. Hey, it's been a it's been an awesome talk, man. <laughs> it has. And Ed, thanks for being on. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and Ed, so Ed, before you go, where can uh, where can people find out more about your ideas and what you have going on? I just written and published a book. It's called Just Policing: mm -hmm. My Journey to Police Reform, and it's available through my website, which is www.justpolicing one word justpolicing.org. And that is a, uh, not just a memoir, but a lot of the innovations and experiences that I went through in my life. And a lot of it was done in Eastern Europe too. Mm -hmm. And there are some recommendations of where we can be taking policing to a different level. So thank you. I like it. Cool. We'll have to check that one out. <laughs> right. Well, Grizz, I think that you and I can both agree. Ed needs to go back to work instead of being retired. Yeah. Sorry, Ed. You got to get back into the back into the shit. <laughs> yeah. At least he's writing books about it and spreading information. But, you know, That's true. I think we need more people like Ed who are more interested in uh, community policing and community uh, interactions instead of just busting down doors and shooting kneecaps. So maybe finding the right way to do things. I mean, it's the type of guy I don't think he'd mind to get into it too much. I think he goes for the for the mm. long con, you know, he's. He wants to, to get the right answer versus just, oh, we corrected the numbers. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I, I can tell by talking to the guy, he cared about, you know, the numbers, but he cared more about the results. Mm -hmm. Because, Absolutely. you know, the numbers are a good metric, but at the end of the day, if that's all you're looking at, you're not really going to get anywhere. Yeah. It'll be a quick fix. and It'll be over. And as he said in the show, he doesn't like fixes. That's right. He likes proper solutions and basically starting over. Thank you again for listening to Beautiful Bastards. New episodes every Monday. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> New episodes every other Monday. Okay. Thank you again for listening to Beautiful Bastards. New episodes every other Monday. Remember to like and subscribe. Just to fly in the ointment, Hans. Monkey in the wrench. <laughs> People are not supposed to be at the mercy of the law. Law is supposed to be at the mercy of the people.